Welcome to the Dream, Plan, Start, Grow podcast hosted by Allison Turner. In each episode, we interview real everyday entrepreneurs to learn how they got their start, what challenges they faced and overcame when starting the business, and what successes each has had. Welcome to the Dream, Plan, Start, Grow show. My name is Allison Turner. I am the host. I created this show to interview other entrepreneurs on how they got their start to educate people that maybe want to start a business or are in the early stages of starting a business on tips and tools that you may be able to use to help your company grow. Today I have with me Deborah Tendridge, who is the founder of the nonprofit Eat Better, Live Better. And she has created this, I don't know how many years ago, but I know I've seen the growth over the last few years. So when did you get started with Eat Better, Live Better? I founded the organization back in 2016. Okay. So it's been January. six years already, huh? Mm-hmm. Over six and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was it just you when you first started with the organization? Yeah, it was me, but I did have to create it with a board and right. we had to have some initial support in the beginning. Every good idea has a team. Yeah, no, absolutely. And what was the purpose, the original purpose of the organization when you founded it? Well, back in 2013, I lost 70 pounds and reversed my daughter's medical conditions with food. And through my journey of my own transformation, I looked back and I realized that I never knew how to (laughs) eat better and live better. So I actually designed a curriculum to teach kids in the community how to eat better and live better. Okay. And is that part of your curriculum still today? It is. It is. We've worked with over 11,000 kids. Wow. And uh, we just transitioned and added our grocery assistance program when COVID, on the onset of COVID. Okay. So you saw then the need in 2020 when the pandemic hit that people were losing jobs, losing careers and needing funds to basically buy groceries. It was a food crisis. That's what I call it, a food crisis. And that food crisis has actually gotten worse uh, over the past few years. And um, it's a good thing we did start it because we're filling a need that is is needed right now. It's so, so sad what's going on in the community. Okay. So you felt that you needed to be in play as well? Because I know there's other like food banks and different organizations out there that just do that. And that's kind of their focus as an organization and how they were founded. So you felt that wasn't enough and that you needed to kind of step in. Yeah, we, yeah, we do it a little differently. We provide only healthy groceries. Okay. So a lot of folks with medical conditions or um, special dietary needs come to us that cannot eat at other locations because uh, we have specific standards for the quality of food, nutritional value of food. We don't include certain ingredients. And also we deliver. So we have a oh, actually have so <laughs> we actually have a great partnership with DoorDash. DoorDash actually funds uh, oh. the drivers to deliver unlimited amount of groceries for us within 10 miles of our organization. So those seniors who are on a fixed income and can't drive or disabled, families who can't afford to put gas in their car to get to the other food banks, uh, they're able to come to get food from us because we'll bring it to them. Okay, now how do they place like an order for food? I mean, is it like a, I know, I'm sure it's not like an app, I mean, like, I want this today. It's actually on our website. People can go right to our website and do an application for groceries. Most of our families have been referred to us by someone in the community that has identified them as food insecure, meaning they don't have enough funds to get their own food or they don't have any food at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you serve specific like area? Like I know you're headquartered in Delray Beach, Florida. So are you just Delray? Are you Delray in kind of the surrounding area? Or? Entire Palm Beach County. Oh. Uh, every now and then we do travel down to Broward for certain events or food distributions that we're invited to help with uh, when there's a large need. But our primary focus is definitely Palm Beach County and South Palm Beach County. Okay. And as a nonprofit, what's been your greatest challenge? Money. (laughs) (laughs) All nonprofits will say that. Yes, all nonprofits need money. And now 
it's always so important at the moment, but right now it's really more important than any other moment in the past. You know, everyone is experiencing this big I word, inflation. Yeah. Uh, but people don't realize nonprofits are meeting the needs that the inflation has created for the community. So while you know there is some government assistance, there's a huge marginalized group of people who don't qualify. So where do they go? Their rent was just raised two hundred to fifteen hundred dollars mm-hmm. a month, mm-hmm. and now their rent's due, and <laughs> any disposable income they have is gone, or they're in a deficit now, and so now they're choosing between their electric bill or food. And you're having now kids rationing and skipping meals. You have seniors who eat cat food. Oh, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty food, sad right? what's going on. And this is the first time a lot of these folks have ever needed help before. So they are 80 years old calling us and have been self-sufficient their entire life. And the last few months has changed the dynamic of their entire lifestyle. Wow, because I know animal food, food has gone up having six animals at the house. So I'm, I can only imagine if that's still cheaper than the people food. Well, we also <laughs> do collect pet food because, uh, and distribute that to our families with pets um, when we okay. have it available because we know a lot of the families, if they can't afford food for themselves, they definitely can't afford for their dogs. And right. what happens is, you know, that that people love their pets. I have three cats, two dogs <laughs> <laughs> and a kid. <laughs> and, um, but you know, a lot of folks will pay for their or share their food with the animals. So they're actually eating less just so their animals can eat too. Uh, uh, so we have a few uh, animal places like Salty Paws. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're actually doing a food drive for us okay. and a pet food drive so we can help feed these these hungry families that have pets and make sure that they don't have, um, you know, that cost out of their own pocket, which they don't have. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that people don't understand about nonprofits, um, I interviewed one other nonprofit so far, um, founder, is that, you know, even if you get grants or different things like that, that they cover specifically whatever the grant is for. So if it's for food, for example, that's what it covers. It doesn't cover your overhead costs of like the rent of your location or any staff or anything like that. Or utilities or refrigeration or things like that that we need just to sustain the organization. You know, we have vans that we go pick up food and deliver food Uh with. Uh, the other grants may not cover the insurance to pay for the the van or the gas to put in the van for us to travel and deliver these groceries. So there are a lot of expenses that people don't realize. Uh, Just because we're a nonprofit doesn't mean we don't have to pay for things. (laughs) I wish, just because you're a nonprofit, we snapped our fingers and everything was free, but it's not. Everyone would be a nonprofit then. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, what's interesting is a lot of people have this vision of what a hungry person looks like but the face of hunger has drastically changed um it's actually probably been marketed a certain way for many years when really the average person experiencing hunger is working or they're a senior on a fixed income who is unable to work and you know those seniors have worked their entire lives to get their social security but the amount of social security income they're getting cannot sustain their basic needs any longer. Uh, 20 years ago, you know, $15 an hour was a great income. Now right. you can't pay your rent on $15 an hour. No, not, not in this county at least. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> Maybe in North Florida somewhere that there, there's some kind of it's place. It's a problem that... nationwide right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so did you, when you first started this organization then in 2016, did you see the bigger picture? I know you didn't think necessarily see the food piece that's happened now after with the pandemic but I mean did you see kind of where it was going to go as far as grow because I know I often talk with clients of mine about you know like writing out that bigger vision you know so even if you're starting here you know what where do you see the organization going well I do want to be a household name you know eat better live better just being able to recognize that as the theme of your life. Right. Uh, eat better is also, is all about food. Live better is about exercise and lifestyle, not smoking, you know, not drinking, you know, not doing drugs, not right. pouring unnecessary chemicals onto your skin and body, but having just an 
altogether healthier lifestyle. And uh, I did see the bigger picture as possible, uh, which we kind of actually did, is we turned it into a curriculum that, mm -hmm. like a train the trainer model, so teachers and staff all over the country could uh, learn our curriculum and teach it to their kids um, all over. Plus we're doing other things right now too. But initially it was really just refining our curriculum to make sure it's effective. We had a master's student from Lynn University come in, adopted our organization for their master's project, and yeah. uh, we're over 100% effective. <laughs> so they did the, <laughs> we did, <laughs> we're evidence-based, which is nice. Yeah. And uh, at first it was just elementary, and we did some team programs, but now we even expanded to do some college workshops at FAU, and we've even done stuff at Everglades University. So, I mean, we've had some great growth and opportunities to share okay. to share our mission. That's great. So you're, I mean, how many of these workshop type things do you do typically like a month? Well, it's, we've restructured a little bit since the pandemic and our focus has been on food because right. uh, a lot of kids can't even learn if they're not getting food. So we have been focusing on the nutrition curriculum for the summer at camps. So okay. we did work with about a thousand kids over the summer in collaboration with one of our best partners, Digital Fives. Mm -hmm. uh, the county actually funded um, these wellness workshops where we do, they do dance, we do nutrition. Okay. And so these kids get a well-rounded, fun, hands-on <laughs> curriculum and get to dance and move. And it's, great. It's, it's a lot of fun over the summer. We And then we do the college workshops throughout the year whenever we're asked, at least um, with FAU, we do a quarterly and and Everglades whenever they call us, but it's, that's not our core focus right now. Healthy food into people's homes and refrigerators and pantries is what we're really, really focused on. Okay, okay. And what do you see as your big biggest success to date? It would be the grocery distribution. I mean, people can see, touch, and feel the food. They can help bring the food to the family's homes. So adding this program has really grown our organization uh, tremendously. Uh, it's hard for people to really want to support the nutrition education, even though it's probably more important and in some ways yeah. to, to, instill <laughs> these, to, to instill these values and principles and knowledge of, of nutrition from a child moving forward. So they can, I call it nutritional responsibility. They can become nutritionally responsible when they have this information. But, you know, the fingerprinting process and only having a few people who can come and help with the kids they didn't feel as connected to the program as with the food. Yeah, well, and that, I guess that makes sense to some degree, especially when you have to go through all the hoops to mm, I know. <laughs> get, get into these schools and everything um, versus you know being able to just to hand someone that's in need like a bag of groceries. Exactly, exactly. Which, and fresh produce. Uh, what also sets us apart is how fresh our produce is. It's better than what you'll find in the stores. Yeah. So we actually buy the produce wholesale and give it out the same day we receive it. So the families oh, wow. have the longest shelf life Mm -hmm. when it comes to the food. And that's important because mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say this and have it sound um, bad, but <laughs> a lot of other organizations will do food rescue, which is a very important thing to do as well. But with produce, when you get at the end of the shelf life and then give it to a family and they only have one day to use, use it, it. Right. most of that produce gets thrown away and that doesn't solve the hunger problem. So our goal is to make sure that they have access to the freshest produce so they have more than 24 hours to use it before they have to discard it. Yeah, and I think that's that's important because, I mean, I know, I mean, I go to stores and, I mean, forget some of the some, some of the stores in the area, yeah. so, <laughs> which I won't name, but, uh, I mean, there's definitely some, I go to the kind of my certain favorites and then pick up most of the stuff at those stores and then uh, may fill in at the other the other store. <laughs> well, it's interesting because a lot of our families have even said, thank you for the fresh produce because right. their diets, one, that's really sometimes the only thing they can really eat. And yeah. second, they're not getting, you know, produce that they have to, you know, peel away like stuff. You could tell it's kind of just been sitting somewhere for a month mm, or two yeah. and, you know, <laughs> or a couple of weeks and it's and on the end of the life. Early yeah. And then sit there for. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're getting stuff they can actually use, eat, and it tastes good because it's so fresh. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, what you do, you know, around that education, you know, the education piece and then obviously giving out the food is like so important just because, I mean, I've, I've watched enough documentaries about our, the American food industry and seen it and, you know, even was listening to a book on Audible the other day and they're like, grass fed beef does not mean it's grass fed to the end of the, you know, cycle. Like if, you know, apparently they have like 30 days where they can pop them on like grain and they're like, it has to say grass fed and finished. And I hadn't heard that before. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> right. And just like chicken, it, there's a difference between cage free and free range. Oh yeah. You know, there's a and lot of these. raised. Right. So there's a lot of these terminologies that, oh, it sounds good. It's cage free. Oh, yeah. But no, they're still in a pin. You know, <laughs> yeah, free exactly. ranges are actually open on a farm, enjoying their best life, right? So there's a difference between how they're raised to and how they're fed. I mean, you're not the healthiest when you're stressed out. No. So if you're eating a stressed out animal, <laughs> you well, know, aside from the hormones and chemicals that go in them, yeah, you know, you have to really animals eat. that don't eat what they should be eating. <laughs> exactly. So you know, you're eating a cow that's fed on soy and corn and stuff that they normally wouldn't eat. Yeah. You know, and that's genetically modified most of the time that now we've got, that's what you then turn around and eat. You're not just eating the cow, you're eating what they actually ate in their lifetime too, so. And with that though, a lot of communities don't have an option to eat anywhere else. No. You know, they're forced because, you know, a lot of these communities that are called food deserts where they don't have a grocery store within walking distance of where they live, yeah. they're forced to eat at these fast food restaurants and corner stores because that's all they have access to. You know, a lot of folks, people will say, why don't they just drive to the grocery store? Well, <laughs> they don't have, they don't have a car. <laughs> right. Why don't they walk? Well, if you are a single mom with four kids, you can't walk. And in Florida, rain sometimes stays on in. And, yeah. you know, you can't take four kids walking in the pouring rain. Well, you yeah, know, walking back and forth. And <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you, and you can't expect a 78-year-old senior on a walker to do the same thing. No. And the same thing with the buses. There's not benches at every bus stop. So if you're an older person or elderly or if you have a large family with kids and there's nowhere to sit while you're waiting for the bus either, it's very, very difficult for a lot of people to travel on the bus uh, in some areas because there's no bus shelters for the rain and there's no benches to sit on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so how is, I know you have a daughter who obviously has grown around some, grown up around some of this. <laughs> um, like, is she super supportive of what you do? Obviously, I'm sure you pull her into a lot of what you do yeah. too. So <laughs> she needs to be supportive, <laughs> one way or the other. But um, but in general, well, one thing I'm really, you know, proud of her is when she gives me a shopping list. The quality of what she's asking for is so good, and when I show other parents her shopping list for me versus what their kids are giving oh, them, it's yeah. night and day. You know, she's yep. giving me 20, like 20 different vegetables that she can play around with and eat, you know? So that wow. is so good, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's almond milk, not regular milk, because most people are lactose intolerant. Yeah. <laughs> people don't realize it, but uh, you know, that's a big inflammatory, uh, you know, big cause of inflammation is, is milk and dairy. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's just interesting to see how uh, when a parent projects a certain lifestyle, the kids tend to adopt it. Right. They don't have to be perfect because they also go to school and want to hang out with their friends and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, their decisions are better. Their ta their palates are different because yeah. they're used to eating certain foods. So they're, they have acquired these tastes. And my daughter had it a little bit more difficult because I had to transition into a healthy lifestyle myself. So <laughs> I'm from Atlanta where we were eating macaroni and cheese. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was like, can I Yum. have some tea with my sugar? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Everything was full of butter, fried, greasy. And then all of a sudden there was not. <laughs> you know, and a lot of parents say, well, why? Oh, how? Not why, but how did you get your kids to eat? And I said, get the, uh, eat these things. I said, well, technically you're the one feeding them, so they have no choice. Exactly. You know, that's just what's like, in the house, then that's what they eat. <laughs> I'd say, what what did you act like for 30 days when you took caffeine and coffee out of your diet? You know, you're cranky, you're angry, you're throwing temper tantrums too. Yeah. You know, kids <laughs> go through the same thing when you take out sugar and change yeah. 
the ones that people adapt have, to it. Yeah, people have the same response to sugar and food as they would coffee or cigarettes or any other drug <laughs> um, that your body gets used to and, and feels like it needs. Yeah. Yeah, I remember one time um, Jack, my fiance's daughter, um, wanted Cheetos. And I was like, well, we're not getting like a bag of Cheetos in the house. Like I said, can you get, I said, what if we buy snack bags? Can you just eat like one? You know, which is like, you know, a handful, basically. It's not really a whole lot, but because the whole thing with Cheetos, once you open those things up, like you just want to eat the whole bag. And well, I what, do what people do is they open the bag and they snack on it while they look through the pantry, try to figure out what they really want to eat. <laughs> yeah, they're full by the time they finish. But, um, so I started getting her like the, and not that these are like super healthy, but like the, the uh, cheese puff things at Trader Joe's, which were like baked instead of fried and like had a little bit better ingredients than like the Cheetos, which still wasn't great, but I mean, it was like a better compromise than like having Cheetos in the house all the time. Yeah, and, and that's, and it's not like you have to be perfect. You right. just have to make better choices on a regular basis. So if you looked at your life like a business and you were like, <laughs> well, if I make a bad decision for my business every day, it's gonna fail. Well, the same yeah. thing with your body. You know, you have to look at every choice you put into your body as a life choice, like a business decision. Is this going to hurt me or help me? Just like you would for your business. And most people put so much more respect into another person's business. Like an employee will do everything right for a paycheck, but you can't work if you're not healthy and you should invest that same amount of effort into yourself. Right. You get up and go to work even though you don't want to. Well, get up and go for a walk even though you don't want to. <laughs> right? <laughs> get up and, and eat a vegetable instead of that, this or that. Um, I always joke and say, um, you know, people who have a big pizza in front of them, Resi true resistance training is having one slice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. There's a new pizza place like yeah. moving in right around the corner from us. Um, that death by pizza place that, you know, you, during the pandemic you could order from. I know we never ordered from it, but literally they had like an ordering window on a Sunday and they would sell out in like a couple hours and you had to pick it up by a certain day of the week. And apparently they're coming in like literally right around the corner from our house. I do they like, have vegan pizza? Because I'm a vegan. Yeah, I'm <laughs> suspecting they do not. Because um, I think someone actually commented on that, uh, that they did not. Because I only really know one vegan place and vegan pizza place in Delray, so... Yeah. So, I mean, there may be more, but there's only one I know have, of that I've actually tried Izzy, Izzy's Pizza. So, I don't think I've had pizza from there. Yeah, it's on Second Avenue. So, I know they're vegan, they can do gluten free and vegan and all that Very cool. arena. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so getting back to our conversation, I mean, I think that's often the challenge. Like you said, people are more invested in someone else's, whether it's a business or someone else's life and they'll be the first person to give them advice but then they often don't um do any of that themselves i mean it's been amazing to me of you know we just went through obviously this whole health crisis over the last two and a half years but yet people if you listen to some of what's out there not the typical news but more the health side of things <laughs> not the news on cnn and fox and all those, those <laughs> places but you know if you actually look at you know the how a healthy diet actually plays into fighting you know something like covid or even being success susceptible to being sick i mean right. if you look at who covid really affected yeah it's the people that already had like comorbidities correct and, and they were obese huge. they had cancer they had diabetes heart disease yeah they were already impacted by nutrition yeah dietary related illnesses and you know so one thing i'm working on <laughs> is a bill, you know, it's uh, called Warn the Consumer. Um, mm. Basically, what that does is we'll put front of, like on the front of the food packages, a warning label. Other countries yep. do it. Do it. And they've actually seen a reduction in purchasing of certain food items uh, by about 30%, including Israel, Brazil, Mexico, and many other countries. But they don't do it like I want to do it because they want to do it in a sense where it's too much sugar, too much sodium. Sugar owns everything here, so that would never pass. Sugar no. is in everybody's pockets and they have so much money, <laughs> there's gonna be no way for them to say there's too much sugar in anything. <laughs> right. However, on the CDC website, 
there are chemicals and ingredients of food that are listed on there in black and white ink you know, on their website, you can print it out, and it actually tells you it's known to cause cancer, it's known to cause diabetes, it is known to uh, create poor concentration, you know, yep. for ADHD for children who are having problems in school. All these things are actually listed, and a lot of the ingredients and in foods now are banned in other countries. If you look at any warning label on any item that you buy, it'll tell you if it causes cancer. It will tell you if it's a choking hazard, Yep. but food won't do that. <laughs> However, I have spoken to some elected officials uh, and they thought it was already done. I'm like, no, when have you ever seen this on the, <laughs> you're like, they're, they're, I guess basically like, I can't believe it's not already done. Let me rephrase that. Yeah. You know, and, and it was shocked because in essence, a warning label that's not on a food, but the ingredients are known to have uh, an impact in getting cancer. It's crazy. It's to me. It's crazy that it's not being done. But right. I'm gonna fight for that. I'm gonna push for it. With the amount of obesity, the amount mm -hmm. of diabetes, the amount of heart disease and, and cancer, that's that the numbers keep rising. I feel that a lot of it could be prevented if people knew that this has something in there that could affect me. And so you know, as soon as we get all the, the verbiage and everything done and we get the final congressperson to help sponsor this bill, um, we're gonna be reaching out to those large, you know, diabetes and cancer mm -hmm. associations to get on board with this, especially as a tool for prevention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think obviously one way to prevent is not to eat all the processed crap to begin with, but. <laughs> <laughs> but people don't know and they don't always have access. So we're yeah. hoping this will do one of two things raise awareness or let manufacturers change their ingredients. Yeah. So if there's one ingredient that they have, instance, high fructose corn syrup or the red and yellow dyes or BPAs or all these things that are known, you know, to affect your health, maybe they'll change, you know, just slightly to, um, an, with an improved ingredient, not one that's worse that's not on the list of things you can't use. <laughs> yeah, improved ingredient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. It doesn't cost less and <laughs> make you feel worse. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, knowing some of the big industry stuff, uh, we can hope. <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, but I know that it's and going back to the, the original conversation yeah. of, you know, how you're providing healthy groceries to these families and seniors and things like that. Because I know like even in you know, my shopping, you know, when I look around, I mean, cause I go to, I do a lot of Trader Joe's, I do a lot of Costco just because they have better organic stuff there um, than at some of our other local establishments. And, um, you know, without going, I mean, I could go to Whole Foods too. Whole Foods is, you know, whole paychecks. <laughs> so it's even more expensive than some of the other stuff. Um, but it's just interesting to me that, you know, everything is, you have to and then pay attention to where your food is coming from too because half the time you know they kill the cow here and they ship it to china and they process Repackage it, over it there. and send it right back you know, <laughs> you're vegan, so you don't eat the cow but um but for those people that do eat you know you have to be pay attention to where all that's being done too um you know so there's all these other pieces in the the big picture yeah but those who are finding it challenging to eat healthy uh, a lot of people find it easy to pick one ingredient items, fruit, veggies, meat, you know, not bologna in a prepackaged yeah. thing that you have to <laughs> peel open and then you have to like peel off a slice. I mean, not that. I mean, you know, <laughs> but you definitely want to be careful. Uh, when I lost my weight, I avoided things from boxes and bags. Yeah. And that helped me a lot. So usually if it's in a box or a bag, it has many ingredients that you don't need. And I've been telling people, you know, people think there's so many foods that have, you would never think are unhealthy. Like microwave popcorn. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah, it was actually labeled so you as one of the- just posted that? <laughs> no, I didn't just post that, but I've been telling people no, for years. Someone just put, I literally just yeah? read like a post like yesterday or something oh, right. about like the evils. I mean, I've heard it before, like you said, but. Like I just reread it the other day and I was like, someone just posted it about like the evil. So some other health person. Um, yeah. Uh, the There's another one? Of, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> evils of microwave popcorn and how well, like people every single one of them. It's so bad. I've been telling people for years. What happens is they line these bags yeah. with chemicals and when you heat up 
the chemicals absorb into the popcorn, then you eat it. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what she was saying. She's like, we can't find one bag that doesn't do that. Do that. Yeah. I was like, so I tell people a trick, buy the kernels, which is actually cost saving because yeah. uh, so you don't have to pay for the packaging or those chemicals. And <laughs> Make sure you they're just, GMO free. Yeah, you buy the, <laughs> the, the kernels. Just get a brown paper bag if you need to microwave, you want to be super easy. Put those kernels in the brown paper bag and microwave them. Or put them on the stove like you used to do in the in in the in the older days. Back day, you know, back then we used to put them on the stove and pop it. I don't think I ever did that. I had an air no? popper. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Well, you were fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, someone bought me one, so I was like, okay, I know how to do that. <laughs> but I know people that did the stove. Yeah, stove and it actually thing. tastes better when you do it on the stove, or you know, without the chemicals in the brown paper bag, because there's no line chemical lining in those bags. Right. So those are two more cost-effective ways to actually buy and eat popcorn. Yeah. No, I think that's that's true for sure. And um, as long as it's non-GMO popcorn, <laughs> which is the other issue with corn, you know. <laughs> so we've got the uh, the next thing out there. <laughs> so, um, but honestly, I would rather people um, eat corn than corn chips. So, I mean, there's still there's still a balance there because I prefer people to make healthier choices yeah. little by little than overnight. You some no. I'm cold turkey like. Um, no, I can no, just I can't do cold turkey. Uh, most, most people can. Most people can. <laughs> but I usually I did everything cold turkey. I quit. When I, I used to smoke two packs a day or one Ooh. pack a day. Yeah, I used to. I quit cold turkey, cigarettes. I used to bite my nails. I have a good gown now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are actually. And I quit biting them. Cold turkey. You know, I became vegan. Cold turkey. Wow. I quit Coke. A cola. Cold turkey. <laughs> and yeah. you just say Coca Cola. Coca Cola. <laughs> cold turkey. You know, I just that's my personality. It's all or nothing, right? Yeah. And a lot of people aren't like that. So what I tell them is make one small change every week, which is fifty two changes a year. Or make adjustments to your current plate, right? So if you're addicted to salt, instead of having a whole bowl of um, salted peanuts. Start mixing half salted and half unsalted. You'll still have your salt. You'll get used to that. The next week, reduce the amount of salted until you can just have raw peanuts. Right. And that's a, a, a easy way to adjust your palate into being okay with less salted foods, especially those with high blood pressure or other medical yeah. conditions where salt will affect you. Yeah. So going back to the business side, <laughs> yes. and then we're going to flip back to the business side of the nonprofit because you and I could probably go Correct. on this food I know. <laughs> thing like for the rest of the evening. So we could do a whole uh, podcast just on food in the United States. Um, <laughs> Tune in next episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, but from a business standpoint, obviously, like you said, you started this on your own and now you've built how many people actually are in your organization? I mean, besides the board, I know the board's always been yeah. there, but um, people that actually contribute on the day-to-day. -day. We have a good team. There's two staff uh, and it's me and Kristen. She's the director of fundraising and partnerships. And we're all volunteer run. We have okay. Lee, who's our volunteer, volunteer coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> we have Ellen, who's our volunteer office coordinator. We have Betty, who's our volunteer family coordinator. I mean, she has such a great job. She talks to every single family and gets them set up for groceries. Wow. You know, she then inputs all their data into our CRM system so we can track all this data. Uh, you know, the reason, and we have, you know, probably a 25 core volunteers on a regular basis wow. we can call, but we have even more that you know, like to do events or pop-ups here and there. So probably over a hundred in our database of volunteers that we can always call in at some point. Um, with that being said, the only reason that happened is because we stayed consistent, we showed up to the community and built trust. Yeah. The first three years were so challenging because nobody wanted to give us money because they're like, you can disappear. We don't want to give yeah. to a nonprofit that in three years is going to go bye-bye. We just wasted our money then. So really, it was so hard. <laughs> when I started, I didn't have money. I had $15 in my bank account. So I really started with nothing and I built it, you know, through just being and showing up, being there and showing up. And 
Businesses are similar, you know, oh, we're yeah. st- nonprofits are still a business. We still have to account, do accounting. We still have payroll. Oh, God, we still that. have, we still have, <laughs> you know, the same business structure. We still have yeah. to file taxes, our 990s. Yeah. We still have to do all these different things and register with the secretary of state. Everything a business has to do, we have to do, except we have to do it better. Because <laughs> you're more <laughs> scrutinized. Than- we are, we are yeah. required to be transparent. Yeah. We are try- required to show the world where every dollar goes and how we spend everything. So we are actually um, a business times, like we're, we're the difference between a regular fitness person and a bodybuilder. <laughs> 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 you know, it's just, it, we have to be that much more efficient and that yeah. much more uh, open and transparent with just our booking and how we run our business and still respect the families that we serve. You know, we don't exploit our families. We don't show their faces. Oh, look at this poor child hungry. You know, they're our neighbor. Yeah, you probably know them. They you know, they go to your kid's school. No, we don't advertise our families. <coughs> you know, there's ways to do things. A business is a for-profit, so people are spending money. So it's easy to take a photo. Oh, they're coming in to do this or do that. We also have to be creative with marketing because, you know, I had to go, my mom and I had to go to food pantries when I was growing up. My mom would never want her photo taken and put on a flyer. Right. You know, so, and that's common with many other Mm -hmm. um, people that we serve. So we actually, to, for marketing, created our Hands of Hunger campaign where we take photos of the family's hands on the grocery bags. Yeah. And respect their privacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, like that creative with the marketing piece, you know, because you always see those. Oh, you know about marketing, don't you? Yeah. (laughs) But you always see those commercials that always drive me nuts, you know, about these starving kids in Africa, like for a dollar a day, you know, and it's some, you know, picture that they flip up there and who knows if the child actually, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Who knows if the child actually lives in Africa Mm -hmm. or not, but, uh, you know, for a dollar a day, you can help him to, you know. Yeah, but for $25 a month, you could become a grocery guardian guardian and sponsor groceries for a family in need. You know, that is true. That's local. And these are... That's the way you can help your neighbors by becoming a grocery guardian. Uh, obviously, we don't want you to do 25. We want you to do like way more. But to start. I'm just joking. <laughs> We're grateful for everything. <laughs> yeah. People can do $10 a month too. Okay. It's just they don't be, they're not considered a grocery guardian until they um, can sponsor the produce or the groceries right. for a family um, that month. So, but yeah, we appreciate all support. We're grateful for anyone who walks through our doors, whether they need help or they want to give help. Okay. So, I mean, the biggest thing you said you need is money at this point. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. We can do so much more with the money. We can buy food in bulk. We can, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. Like, we have been getting major support with food drives. And that helps tremendously. Yeah. You know, it really reduces the amount of food we actually have to purchase. And we do collaborate you know, partnerships and collaboration is key for us too. We've partnered with other feeders, other organizations that provide food. We receive food and give food to them. You know, so those are partnerships. We do events together. We support each other. We share grant opportunities. It's not, uh, not every organization is like that either, but for us, we like to partner and there's plenty of people that need food. We're not going to try to take on every single hungry person. It's impossible. <laughs> I don't think you could do that. No. <laughs> we can. I mean, it has to be a group effort. Yeah. And that's the same thing with the for-profit business, just like other nonprofits. You build strategic partnerships. I mean, plumbers, they have their suppliers. They have different, you know, um, contractors and stuff they partner with. That You have, you know, the school, right? They have um, all these different vendors that help supply things. Finding the right partners, strategic partners and collaborators to work together with is also a huge part of what made our business successful. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's, like you said, it's true of all, you know, companies for profit, not for profit, obviously, you know, even for profit businesses is, you know, like what they do in the community to give back and obviously nonprofit, you know, building those relationships. I mean, it's all about relationships, whether you're for profit or nonprofit. It's all about relationships and how you can impact others, you know, through those relationships. Exactly. And then, you know, it's like karma, you know, comes back, <laughs> comes back to you it does. in a positive way. So it I does. think that's the important, 
the important piece for sure. Um, so if someone wanted to donate to you at this point, what's the best way to do that? Visit eblb.org and do an online donation. Uh, we did, it probably will be, um, also you could drop off food to us. If you're local and you wanna host a food drive, if it's a car load or two, we ask you to bring it. If it's more, we will come and pick up the food donations. If you okay. wanted to host a food drive in your community, at your business, if you have a club or a group or organization, a faith-based organization, a school. Uh, we just did this really, really cool food drive with the JCC in Boynton. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they have 200 kids in their daycare. They decorated grocery bags and then took them home and brought back the bags full of food. Uh -huh. And then we came, obviously, there's 200 bags. So we're not like gonna have them. <laughs> we went and picked it up. We did this cute picture with some of the kids. It was just really sweet. So there's also ways to engage youth okay. um, as far as understanding volunteerism and that people, they're fortunate and yeah. not everyone is in that situation. We have kids who go home and they open up their pantry or their refrigerator and there's nothing in there. And they have to wait until they go to school the next day to get food. To right. get food. Yeah, it's a sad, sad uh, condition we live in. Mm -hmm. but, and right now, we're as far as businesses go, because this is more focused on business opportunities. You know, we're really big into making long-term positive impact in right. people's lives. And many people, we were talking this, about this earlier, how you know you can make a certain amount of money, but then you make one more dollar and you get access to no help at all. And right. with the inflation, those people with no access at all yeah. need the help. So a lot of people you know, hear the word food stamps, the SNAP benefits that we have here, and most of the folks on it are working or they're seniors on a fixed income. And with that being said, the seniors on a fixed income, a lot of them have called us and they're asking for help now because their food stamp limits have been reduced to maybe $16 a month. $16 a month, what can you so buy now with it, that? It, <laughs> the card costs more than that, right? Yeah. So with that being said, you know we're having to help them reapply or find someone to help them to see if they can get more, sometimes they're not. And then there's that one marginalized group that gets nothing. So right now we're working on writing an opportunity to work with legislators to increase the SNAP benefits for income brackets okay. and bring back the original amounts for 12 months. You know, obviously they like to sunset, you know, yeah. these kind of, you know, in, um, investments into programs like this, but hopefully it could also be extended. But that would help so many people take some of the pressure off of feeders because we're not the only one who is strained right now with the need <laughs> to feed. It's all the food banks. We just were on the news with this same thing and they called the other food banks and they're all struggling. They're all short on food, the supply chain, the cost of fuel to, to, to ship the food. Everything is putting a damper on access for not just people, because I use the grocery store and see that some things have run out. We don't have access to that either. Right. And the less access the grocery stores have because they have priority, then what the grocery stores don't get, then the charities get. But because the grocery stores are low and they're not even getting it, there's not a surplus of food for the charities to get access to, which makes it even harder. Wow. Interesting. I hadn't even thought about all that. <laughs> yeah. So other ways to support. <laughs> uh, you can volunteer if you're not able to you know, financially support. Your time is just as valuable. It's actually valued at about 29 bucks an hour. <laughs> so we can calculate how much you've actually invested into our organization by multiplying the hours you volunteered wow. by like 29 and some change. Uh, so you actually do add a, a great value. If we you know, monetize all the volunteers that we have, it's a lot of money. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but you know, we have three people who give between 20 or 40 hours a week on a weekly basis anyways. A so just with those three people, we've had less uh, personnel costs because our right. volunteers are so committed to making sure people get food. And these are our neighbors. These are our hungry neighbors. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Because I, I know even volunteers are hard to come by sometimes, especially like ones that are committed to, you know, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go like once a week to the local food bank and, you know, which is still good. Don't get me wrong. So I'm not yes. saying it's bad. Every, but, every minute helps. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, for, to find someone that's willing to like do 20 to 40 hours a week. Yeah. And then we have this amazing woman named Jackie. She helps with social services. Yeah. So outside of food, what do you need? Right. Housing, yeah. Right. Whether Clothes. you can't pay your water bill and yeah. your water's cut off, or if you don't have a mattress, then you're sleeping on the floor. Or if you need a wheelchair and or you need dental work and you have no insurance and you're abscessed and you're in pain, uh, we can help connect the dots to find resources for our families to have access to those things too. And she's a volunteer. She volunteers so many hours um, wow. just doing the social services, probably 20 to 40 hours a week, too. And she's a blessing to so many of our families. You know, we have a little form. They fill out what they need help with. She calls them or she'll come in and help pick up food or organize some drives and help also secure funding opportunities. These people have made the biggest impact in our organization, not me. You know, I can't do it all. Everyone no. has a skill that they can, you know, we have Michael Manning. He does our IT. He comes in anytime we have a computer issue or a printer issue. I call him, he shows up, make sure we're networked, make sure yeah. this or that. All these are volunteers who have a skill that I don't have or that I don't have time to really invest right. in that because I'm spread so thin that, you know, they're so valuable. They're so valuable. Yeah. We need a website right now, by the way, if anyone wants to donate. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just gave that hint to me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right, we'll, we'll talk after this. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. You're not that. joking. You can cut that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not joking. Otherwise, you wouldn't have said it. <laughs> we need a lot. We need a lot of help right now. And honestly, uh, so do all the businesses. Yeah. Businesses in general are we lost a lot of business support because inflation has reduced right. their profit margins. So we're really mm -hmm. looking for also new businesses to support us because we have lost, even, even though they want to, they right. just can't right now. Yeah. So as we start to wind down, I have a couple more questions. Okay. So, cause I know since you started in 2016, I mean, how many hours do you put in yourself? Cause I know, <laughs> I know even when you're off, you're often on. Yes. <laughs> so, so even when you're off, I mean, I mean, you're still not that you're scoping out opportunities, but if you see an opportunity, then you're going to like take it, even if you're not technically, you know, on the clock kind of thing. So, well, one thing about leading an organization or any business is you do have to lead by example. You have to show you're just as committed to the success, right. whether you had a team or not. And that requires a lot more hours behind the scenes, on the scenes, uh, doing things that people don't even see you doing. Right. You know, so I would probably say probably at least 50 to 80 hours a week I'm putting in. Um, and that's actually um, a little bit less now because I have more volunteer support okay. and I'm in school. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a mom, a <laughs> single mom. So, you know, I'm trying to juggle all this while keeping my body healthy by exercise. And, yeah. you know, so I'm. it's really a hard balance right now, especially because I feel so responsible for so many people's, you know, lives right now. If something happened to me and I couldn't do my job, thousands of people would not eat. And, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on me. So I know... I have to show up. I have to do what it takes. And my volunteers feel the same. Yeah. And I mean, and obviously you have to be healthy to do all that. Exactly. So making sure you, like you just said, eat well, exercise. Because um, I know the tendency, I mean, at least my tendency, you know, when I get stressed is, you know, easy meals, which is usually go find something that's quick and not that I'm a huge fast food proponent because I'm not, but, um, you know, kind of the step between fast food and restaurants, like the Chipotle kind of place, which is still, I guess, fast food, but, you know. Look at their sodium. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, something that's like quick and easy and doesn't require my time to make. But a know? banana is just as easy as bag chips. 
True. Right? So a lot of people have to retrain their brain and how they think. For instance, yeah, if you take it. Brothers, butter is my go-to snack. Yeah, exactly. So if you look back at how your brain is trained, quick and easy is always unhealthy. Yeah. It's fast food. It's And it goes back to association. You go to the doctor, you get a shot, and they give you a lollipop. <laughs> yeah. You do well in school, pizza party, cake, ice cream. You're... You're older, here's cake and ice cream, right? Every single happy moment in your life has been related to unhealthy food. Yeah. So quick and easy is a slice of pizza, is drive through the M word. I don't say that word. <laughs> McDonald's. I don't use that word. That's a curse word in my office, you know? <laughs> Actually, part of our code of ethics. I disagree with you, but. <laughs> part of our code of ethics is that anyone who is wearing you know, eat better, live better material, clothing, merchandise. If I find out, no, I'm not even joking. They're not allowed back in our organization because they make us look like hypocrites. Oh, if you find they actually go to McDonald's? Is it no, just McDonald's in our, or any? In our, no. Oh, in your in attire. Our, in our attire. I can force people to do it. But if I find <laughs> anyone that is, I let them know they actually sign a code of ethics that they will not do anything outside of what our mission represents in our merchandise. Because, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's, it's important. Branding is for business overall, it's trust. If right. you are selling something and you are doing the opposite, oh, you yeah. are not going to be a trusted brand. No. Period. You have to le live the life you're selling. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> I mean, that's what I, I mean, I, even in entrepreneurship, I try and tell people that want to start a business. I'm like, you know, your health is just as important as, you know, the health, the mindset, the business knowledge, like those all go in hand in hand. Because if one thing goes down, whatever that is, exactly, you know, then the other two aren't necessarily going to pick that up. I mean, if you lose your health for some reason, um, you know, they're not going to these two things over here are not going to pick it up necessarily. They may be able to hold it for a little bit, but, right. you and know, but not for long. You got to figure out what this is. If you're feeling crummy, your work is going to suffer. Suffer. Exactly. So, you know, being the best you and showing up for your team the best possible way you can yeah. and showing up for yourself. Right. You, know, you do have to show up for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people put themselves the last is what I find, you know, like they'll put their kids in front, they'll put their spouse in front, but then they won't take care of themselves when, you know, it's like the, the little airplane analogy that everyone uses, you know, you have to put your oxygen mask on first before assisting someone else. Right. So if you don't take care of yourself and you go down, then who's taking care of the people you are helping? Right. And that's where, you know, my fear is thousands of people. Yeah. Well, rely you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. They rely <laughs> on me. You know, one, you know, one bad thing that happens to me, Thousands of people are suffering. So, you know, you also have to create leaders. Yeah. And part of leadership, good leadership is creating other leaders and building people up into leaders and not just entrusting people to and delegate. You know, yeah. I have a trouble. Kristen, she says I'm getting better, but it took me a while to trust her, you know, yeah. in the organization. So at first I was always over her shoulder, like, you know, what uh -oh, are you doing? Micromanager. Yes. Beep, beep, beep. Exactly. So she, <laughs> you know, and I told her, like, when I'm doing it, let me know. Because I know I have control issues. That's my baby, right? right. I grew it. I developed it. It means a lot. So for me to release some of the responsibility on how she speaks about it, emails about it, every word, you know, <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah. it's all, it's also important to me. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I understand. I, I have that. I mean, I, I'm less so now probably than I used to be, but um, like yeah. you, but I luckily am, <laughs> I mean, my current assistant is fabulous. So, I mean, luckily I'm blessed in that right. respect. So, so you want to build a team. So like, I'm like, here, have more. Right. Take it all. <laughs> and now I think she's like, okay, Deb, now you're taking overboard. <laughs> <laughs> I got enough. Um, <laughs> But what would, if you were going to give advice to someone that wanted to start a business, so not a, it doesn't have to be a nonprofit, it could be for-profit, nonprofit, you know, like you said, like they're both businesses. It's just, you know, the income comes from a different source. Um, you know, what would be the number one thing you would tell someone 
that wants to start a business that maybe either you've learned along the way or maybe you figured out that you knew early on that's really helped you in the growth of Eat Better, Live Better? Well, first, you have to make sure there's a need. Because if you create a business where there is no need at all, <laughs> then you are out of business. <laughs> um, but once you've identified the need and you create a solution, you have to really make sure that you're committed to the success of the business. You have to build trust in your brand, in the community. It will take time. It's not like you open up a website and you have 10 million views and, and people are driving <laughs> you. That? No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to work at building your presence right. and building the trust. So people who you've helped through your organization, business, corporation, have them write a review, post it on Google, show that you're relevant, show that you're um, doing good work, that these people are sharing personal stories with your business. You have to, uh, if, especially if you're starting grassroots with not a lot of money, then a lot of it is the grassroots knocking on doors, telling every person in your phone that you're doing this. How can you guys, how can they support you? You know, a lot of people you find they're more likely to support another company, but another company has been around 30 years. So yeah. why should they trust you? They want, sometimes they want right. to see, you know, so finding a way to get your friends and family to support first, get your experience. Don't take off to more than you can chew. <laughs> you know, when I started my organization, I had to really put the reins on and say, let me do one or two things really, really well and right. then expand. Because if you do 10 things, then you're not doing 10 things well. You really mm -hmm. need to true. you know, focus on a few things, do it really, really well, and then expand and branch out. Now, if you have multi-millions and you can pay for these experts to come in and just do <laughs> it, which most people don't have, but some people do, that's a different story. Then yeah. you can have a wider reach because you already have trained experts taking on these roles that you can incorporate maybe their current followings because if they are successful people already, right. uh, and it's a little different, but you know, I think that this is more focused to people starting a small business with less resources. Uh, I knocked on doors, I joined the chamber, I called every person in the chamber and told them who I was. Hey, I am a chamber member, I am new. <laughs> I want to meet you. I want you to learn about me and I want to learn about you. Don't make it a one-sided relationship. Oh, yeah. You know, it has so to be true. a mutual, ben mutually beneficial. What can you offer me and what can I offer you? How can we support each other? So uh, I don't think there's just one tip. I mean, I think you just uh, have to <laughs> narrow it down to yes. just one. Yeah, I mean, just stay committed. Don't give up. So many people who fail, I mean, who quit were so close to succeeding. Mm -hmm. And the first three years are really tough because you are building that trust. You are building a presence. You are building a database. You are building clientele. This is your building. These are your building years. And I always say, how many times did you fall when you were learning to walk? But <laughs> you're walking through these doors. You're not crawling in. I didn't, <laughs> you're not crawling into a business meeting because you quit walking, like trying to walk because you fell 30 times. No, you know, you, you have to find your niche. You have to find... Right. Get your momentum and, and hang on to it. And when your momentum plateaus, you regroup and see what the problem is and you try again, you know, but you definitely have to make sure that you're solving a problem that's really there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can do it. I, I, I did it and I had nothing to start with, Right. you know? So um, if it's something you're passionate about and I think that people just really need to commit and, and pull through, but trust, building that relationship, showing up, letting people know you're not going anywhere and working hard to make people happy yeah. with your business. And you can't please everyone either. <laughs> so you also have to realize that um, not all money is good money. And oh, some of yeah, the no money kidding. is not worth the, worth the in, um, pain <laughs> that you have to suffer. <laughs> Very true. Well. <laughs> Very true. Very yes. true. Um, so if anyone wanted to get in touch with you, I know you said the website's eblb.org. Which stands for Eat Better, Live Better. Um, my office number is 
1022. And I'm sure it's scrolling on the bottom of the screen at the moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but just in case it's not, grab your pen and paper and write down 561-344-1022. You can visit eblb.org. And obviously we're on social media. So please like and follow us on social media and Instagram and Facebook. It's Eat Better, Live Better, I-N-C. And we are the one with the red apple logo. You'll find it very easily. And if you have experience with us, write a Google review. (laughs) Always marketing. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much. I can't wait for people to learn about Eat Better, Live Better on your platform. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate you joining me. And thank you for joining us on the Dream, Plan, Start, Grow show. Again, my name is Allison Turner. Today I had with me Deborah Tendridge. And um, if you want to learn more about Dream, Plan, Start, Grow, you can go to that website, dreamplanstartgrow.com. You can also find uh, us on YouTube as well as Instagram and Facebook uh, and get some different business tips on there. And if you have any questions about starting a business, you can sign up for a complimentary 30-minute consultation on that website. But thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Dream Plan Start Grow podcast with Allison Turner. If you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Join the Dream Plan Start Grow community by following us on Facebook or Instagram at Dream Plan Start Grow. See you in the next episode.